Our next speaker is Rain Maida. He is the lead singer and of Our Lady Peace. And that video, Yellow Brick Road, captures his journey when he hit the streets to raise $30,000 to build a school in Congo. If you go to his homepage, you'll see links to Make Poverty History, War Child, Apathy is Boring, as well as Race for Dignity. You can see that these are issues that are close to his heart. And if you Google him, you'll find out that him and his wife do a lot of work, and they, sh they use a lot of their time and their resources to further the causes that they believe in. So we have a great opportunity today, live via satellite all the way from Vancouver, to hear Rain Maida share about what is his passion and what is his vision. And we do have a, a camera here, uh, as well as a mic, so he can hear us. So let us, um, once we're online, and this is a technical process, so if there are any glitches along the way, bear with us. We're going to try to make it as smooth as possible. So I see that he's there right now. So let's give him a warm welcome. Uh, uh, thank you. I, you know, I regret not being able to be uh, in Toronto with you guys in person. But I am honored to be able to uh, be part of this conference via modern technology, and hopefully, with a, a little luck, we can, uh, you know, have this see its way through. And uh, maybe I'll even feel like I'm right there in the room with you. Um, George Orwell had, uh, you know, a really powerful quote that I remember reading uh, from his infamous book, 1984, in high school. He said that if you if you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stomping on the the human face forever. Now, I, you know, I was always, uh, I guess, a little bit cynical when I was younger, um, and for some reason, this 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 quote really resonated with me. Um, I, might be uh, my uh, my Catholic upbringing, or uh, my parents' early divorce. I'm not sure, but that's probably more for a uh, a Dr. Phil show than a, than a TED conference. But you know, going back to this Orwell quote and discussing or prophesizing about the future, it's really difficult these days to uh, to talk about the future without hearing, uh, you know, the word sustainability. It's become um, kind of like Marshall McClellan, you know, if you think about um, the way he coined a uh, global village or uh, I guess in the 90s the, the big buzzword was globalization. Uh, sustainability is now that, uh, you know, it's become the, uh, the Justin Bieber of buzzwords, I guess. Um, and, you know, and, and in a sense, what happens when the media gets a hold of these words, they become, you know, somewhat cliches, and, but no more than, you know, driving a hybrid or, or carrying your own bags to the grocery store or, um, you know, trying to shrink your carbon footprint. And, um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a walking cliche, I guess. I'm a, you look at me, I'm a singer uh, sitting here uh, discussing uh, sustainability. It doesn't really get any more cliche than that. But I guess when I hear that word, uh, I generally, you know, I think we're talking about us humans um, basically learning to live, um, you know, much more within our means and a reasonable means, trying to, you know, coexist with, with our environment uh, and ecosystem. Um, but I think, you know, what I can maybe offer to the discussion exists on a, you know, on a little bit of a smaller, more micro, uh, more human level. And that is the idea that in my experience, you know, being a musician and touring over the last 15 years and, and really having... Uh, a, a direct dialogue with with the younger generation and kids at these shows, uh, at after shows, before shows, online now. Obviously, there's there's a lot of dialogue. Um, what I've seen is that you know maybe the greatest challenge that we're facing when we're talking about sustainability is um, is is sustaining interest or sustaining um, you know a younger generation's awareness and sometimes even our own awareness. You know we've all become ADD or at least somewhat ADD in this uh, you know this digital age. I know I have. Um, and you know what's happened is, and I've seen this obviously in the music business, where um, you know we've probably become the uh, the uh, the most um, or the biggest victim of of the digital age in the sense that um, you know I've seen our business drop. I think in the last ten years, from a fifteen billion dollar a year business to uh, you know just under a seven billion dollar a year business, and yes. Definitely piracy comes into that, but I think it would be foolish to discount the fact that the decrease in, in CD sales and, and, and people listening to music, it's, it's also because of, you know, we have all these other diversions these days. We are just bombarded every day by, um, you know, I, I just found out the average age of video gamers is 33. That blew my mind. You know, we have texting, we have, you know, the internet and surfing and Twitter and Facebook. Um, you have... 
you know, 500 HD channels on your television. So naturally music is, you know, is struggling to find its way. Um, um, but, you know, this digital age is, is really um, done more than, than uh, just take away our, our attention. I think it's, I'm finding when I'm talking to a lot of kids on the road that it's, you know, it's desensitized us to in a sense. And once it desensitizes you, what happens is, is you become disconnected. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, the younger generation is really disconnected from the planet. Um, a friend of mine, excuse me, a friend of mine who's a, a publisher in Los Angeles, great guy, he's a, a lifelong music publisher, you know, he lives and breathes music. He, uh, he had an opportunity a, a couple weeks ago because his daughter um, is, you know, is trying to get into some colleges. And so they had to drive from Los Angeles up to, to Berkeley and San Francisco area to look at, at colleges. And so he took this as an opportunity. It was great. You know, 17-year-old daughter is going to get in a car, spend some quality time, really bond. He brought a bunch of his favorite CDs, you know, that, that he probably listened to when he was in college. And, and he wanted to, uh, you know, just sit and, and experience, you know, his daughter and really get to know her in, in, a, in a deeper way during this drive. And so they... They get in the car and Jim sits in the driver's seat, obviously, and his daughter sits in the passenger seat. So she has, you know, she's in charge of the iPod and the CD, and and it's amazing. They're driving up, you know, one of the most beautiful, um, you know, coastal highways probably on the planet, and and she turns on a song and it's great. They got the windows down and the music blaring, and they're all having fun. And then it gets to the end of the first chorus, and his daughter's like, "Dad, I just love the song," and click, she changes the song to another song, and. Um, you know, Jim said his heart just dropped, and and this is what the whole you know his whole drive six seven hours all the way up the coast was, and he was he learned that his daughter you know the and her peers and her friends this is basically the way they're consuming things these days, and and um, you know it, it's kind of scary, and for him being the music business it was you know incredibly scary. So you know the the thought you know that's where I get back to that I think a problem that we're facing is is really with the younger generation is sustaining interest, sustaining attention, um, and and getting over this you know this kind of overload that 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 they're facing. I mean Skype is you know this it's amazing we're able to do this, but I'm also able if I wanted to kind of answer email and and text my mom while we're doing this conference. Not that I'm doing that, I promise. But um, you know I. I'm sure I'm, I, I'm keeping company with a lot of smart people in this room tonight, and um, this, you know, this concept might sound a little ridiculous to me, and somebody's probably trying to reaching to, to to turn me off or, or 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 switch me over to a different channel. But you know, if if you if you think about it, none of us are really immune to this digital culture. Um, so the question again is, how do we create attention, and more more importantly, how do we sustain attention? How do we get to these kids that, that I talk to, you know, kind of after shows every night and, and have dialogues with, with online? How do we get them um, to be able to sustain attention? And, you know, I, I want to point out that um, the desire is there because I, I see that, that, you know, the, you know, kids are inquisitive and they're questioning and, and they, they want it. They just need, or we need to find a way to channel it. And, um, you know, I, I remember growing up, being one of those kids, you know, I, I, I um, I'm sure some of you in this room, I, I grew up listening to, to you two and, um, you know, Peter Gabriel and Bob Marley and Bob Dylan. And these were artists that really resonated with me. And, and I, I, it's probably safe to say that I wouldn't have, you know, ever gotten involved with Greenpeace if I hadn't seen you two, um, you know, protesting, uh, off of, uh, you know, Selfie Island, uh, off the coast of Ireland about, you know, new react reactors that were going to be brought there. Um, Amnesty International, the same thing, you know. Um, so basically, you know, in, in 1993, I signed a record deal with Sony Music. And, and I look at my life in, in the sense of the next seven years, um, and this is probably a, a typical thing for someone who, you know, just finds their passion or, you know, gets into business. You spend, you know, five or six or seven years just pounding the pavement and really trying um, to grow your business and become successful. And, 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 and I felt like I was doing that with Our Lady Peace. We were either, you know, in the studio trying to make good records or we were on, on the road trying to put on great shows and, and build a fan base. And, and, and for the, you know, for the most, you know, looking back on it, the, the plan kind of worked, I guess, in a sense. Um, but I, I don't really see, and this is probably a weird thing to say, but I don't really see my, my connected life starting until uh, 2000 when uh, my wife, who was also an artist, Chantel, um, uh, set up this dinner with, with these two, uh, or this couple that she had, had recently met. And the couple ended up being um, two people named Eric Hoskins and Samantha Nutt, who, who run uh, and co-founded War Child. And um, so we met at, at a Greek restaurant. Course on the Danforth in Toronto, and 
Um, you know, we talked about music, and I should, sorry, I should probably say for those of you who don't know War Child, it's a, you know, it's a not-for-profit organization that, that raises awareness and helps um, young children in conflict regions. So, you know, at this dinner, we, uh, we definitely spoke um, about the, the charity, and we spoke about music, and their charity is very, uh, it has a big music component. Uh, it's very youth-driven, so music's obviously important, and that's why, you know, we were having dinner with them, obviously. But um, somehow, after, uh, you know, a lot of Greek food and a few bottles of wine, uh, I had been talked into traveling to Iraq. And um, so, you know, three weeks later, we're heading to Iraq, and... Um, you know, this was the first time that I felt like, you know, I was able to kind of come out of my shell or, or you know, live outside of this bubble that I had been living in, in the music business. And, and even really growing up in Toronto and, and in a, you know, kind of semi-affluent, uh, you know, middle class neighborhood in Etobicoke. Um, you know, and, and traveling to Iraq was obviously very, uh, you know, eye-opening and uh, it, hard to say, enlightening, there's so many adjectives I can describe it, but, you know, when I, I remember when I got back, um, it was something, you know, just that, that, that experience got into my pores, uh, it was something I couldn't wash off, and I, and I remember I thinking that, you know, okay, the culture shock would be flying into Baghdad, um, trying to film this documentary, which, which was the reason we were going there, to kind of expose how the, the UN sanctions uh, weren't really doing anything to, to harm Saddam, but were really, really harming the, the children there uh, in Iraq, and uh, the culture shock was was completely opposite. It wasn't the Baghdad trip. It wasn't you know flying into that airport. It was actually arriving back in Pearson, and then you know basically trying to reestablish myself in a band. And you know all of a sudden you have to go and back and pay you know five dollars for for a coffee at Starbucks. And it's just it didn't relate with me. And I was and I had a lot of trouble over the next um, couple of years trying to you know to find my way and find my place. And more child became this kind of a really safe place for me, and, I, and, and it kept me feeling connected. So, in 2004, um, Eric, um, the co-founder, myself, and, and George Stromalopoulos, who you probably know from from the hour, uh, we had planned a trip to Darfur this time in the Sudan, and and this was a different trip. This was actually the first time I'd I'd been um, exposed to you know that word sustainability. The 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 the, the mission there was to go find a local partner, and 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 find. Uh, a niche for War Child within, you know, this this incredible disaster that was that was happening in Darfur, and ended up that, um, you know, their niche would be um, dealing with psychosocial um, programs with the kids, you know, trying to get children back to being kids. And uh, we found a great partner in St. Vincent de Paul in Khartoum. And we brought, you know, some some young people from from Khartoum up to Darfur and set up this program. And, and um, you know, so for me, that was my first kind of engagement in sustainability. But, uh, you know, the, the, the thing with Darfur was it, it wasn't actually the trip there that, that I look back on as being the most profound moment in my life. I, it, it happened when, um, actually before we even traveled to Darfur, my wife and I were sitting, uh, you know, in, a, in our apartment in Toronto on Front Street and going or leading up to the... Um, to the to the trip, we were we were getting these security reports from the UN, and, and you kind of you were forced to get these reports because it was such a dangerous um, region. So, you know, the night before, all of a sudden, you know, we get the, the latest security report, and it says that four care workers had been killed by a, a roadside bomb. You know, basically right on the road that we were to travel to the next day to to you know travel up um, to Western Darfur. And I remember sitting there with my wife, and and uh, we had a newborn son. And we spent uh, we spent the whole night awake in our bed, just trying to decide, you know, why should I, why should I take this risk? You know, why what, what what's so important about going to Darfur right now? You know, when it's so violent, security is uh, is is so sparse there. Um, so we went back all night with the pros and cons. You know, we're our, both our careers are going well. We have this newborn son. We're healthy. We're happy. You know, again, why risk it? And 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 finally, after hours and hours of, of kind of deliberation, um, the answer ended up being right, you know, sleeping right there in between us. And it was our new son, Rowan. And, and what, you know, what we kind of decided at that moment was basically, um, you know, there was no way that, that any of those feelings we had before, you know, our kind of foray into, you know, into charity or war child or any of the other, you know, uh, charities that we work with, you know, that disconnect, there was no way that our child or our children we have three young boys now. Uh, there was no way that that disconnect was going to happen to them. So 
you know, um, as my father always said, actions speak louder than words. So, you know, I got on that plane with, with George and Eric and, and we went to Darfur and, um, you know, coming back from there, I, I just feel like, and, and everything we do now, I feel like it's an example set for our children and, and, and it's a way to, uh, hopefully engage them as, as they grow, you know, older and, and see that, you know what, okay, there, there is, there is a uh, value in being connected. And, um, so what, what I think is happening, you know, in this digital age, and unfortunately it's, it's sad to say, looking back on Darfur now, you know, almost five years later is that, um, you know, the, the de desensitization and the disconnect that, that, um, our culture has, has provided, you know, I think Darfur is, you know, I hate to say it, but it's, it's a bit of a failure in the sustainability model. You know, it unfortunately seems that, you know, if something isn't as sensational as like a, a Haiti and not to discount how tragic that is, or, you know, or the tsunami or, or what have you, um, you know, it's really difficult for, for us and even, and, and more difficult for younger people to keep, that attention to sustain that attention, uh, to keep focus. So, you know, um, the challenge that I find in talking to a lot of these kids, you know, um, that I come in contact with on the road is, you know, it's it's to stop really looking for for new sensations. It's it's really to stop or to start looking for, uh, I guess, a bit of a new consciousness and a consciousness that is sustaining. And like I said before, these kids, um, they they want to be engaged, just finding that way. You know, to to engage them, and you know, I I think uh, you know, I did, although I began with that, you know, that Orwell quote uh, of, of of the future looking uh, a little bit bleak. I, I didn't come here thinking that that's you know that's the way I see the future now. Um, you know, I'm here um, with you guys to to witness you know a kind of a collective giving Orwell you know the finger and saying that this is not the way the future is going to turn turn out. You know. Um, I think, you know, I wake up every, every, every day thinking, you know, I have, we have three young boys that we're going to raise with integrity and dignity and, uh, they deserve, you know, a good life and one that's not going to be compromised by, by greed or, or disconnect or irresponsibility. Um, so, you know, tonight, I guess this conference and, and when we're talking about sustainability, it's really about my son or your daughter or your niece or nephew, or it, it's about them reading a book, you know, maybe Robin Hood and, and not skipping over any of the lines. It's about them slowing down and, and, and really taking in um, what they're reading a little bit longer and, and having that, you know, attention's, attention lasting. Um, Cause we, you know, we definitely need to connect ourselves and the generation behind us to this planet in, in a real sustained way. And I, I'm, you know, I say this in a sense that, you know, um, I'm confident that, you know, a lot of you in this room, you are the courageous and you are the brave and, and you know, intelligent, critical thinkers that I'm sure during the course of the evening, you know, the, uh, the ideas that you're going to share and the, and the life experiences that you're going to exchange are what is going to be the, you know, the, the impetus for change. That's what's going to, you know, start the, you know, this, this fire burning. I mean, it's already burning, but it's really about you guys. It's about the ingenuity. It's about the new ideas and new technology. And, and, uh, I think you guys have the power to not only empower yourselves, but also that generation, you know, behind us. So we don't end up saying that, um, you know, you know, we don't have, end up fulfilling that evil trend of, of uh, living off the backs of, of future generations. And, um, you know, for that, I, I want to close by saying that I'm just kind of grateful and honored to be, uh, to, be, to be a part of this. So thank you.